Aloha. This is uh, Politics for the People. Welcome to joining us. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Our topic today is the persistence of our toxic politics and who and what for. You know, we have a panel of discussants for this topic, and I'd like to introduce them. We have Jay Fidel, and we have Karen Buzzard this today. And I'd like to start with uh, uh, asking Jay, how have toxic politics, as we've mentioned in the title of the show, uh, any, has it any boundaries in the current climate? Is there any boundary for it you can imagine? Not yet. You know, we're waiting. <laughs> we're waiting to see guardrails. <laughs> but we haven't seen them, you know. Is there nothing the GOP won't do? Um, and they, we haven't found a limit yet. Um, it's outrageous what they do. And it's destructive to the country. And I, I find it interesting that, you know, people who probably finished high school, um, some of them college, uh, some of them have actually traveled, not many. Um, they, they, they take the position, um, they don't take a position, and the important thing for them is to remain in power and to support the club, the GOP club, and Trump, I guess especially Trump cult. And so in the process, they really don't do anything for the country. Um, and it's amazing, A, that they, they can do that, that they, they don't care. They simply do not care. And B is that the system, you know, of voting and responding to constituents doesn't seem to affect them. I, I find it amazing in so many places in the country where these Republicans are doing completely destructive things to the country. And then anybody who finished high school would see that. Um, people apparently don't see it and don't do anything to control them. You would expect um, their constituents would be lining up outside their door in their local offices, I'm talking about federal delegations in their local offices, um, and banging on the door. That's happened in the past, obviously. Um, and it does affect, it has affected their votes in Congress. Um, but that doesn't happen now. They, they do whatever the GOP wants them to do. And the GOP is very well organized, but it's only to achieve power and to retain power um, and to feed its own needs, uh, say needs for power. So the, you know, the bottom line is that um, what we have is a, is a government that is completely ineffectual um, because Congress that's completely ineffectual um, because um, you don't have the Senate and um, because of uh, Manchin and Cinema, and um, you have the House by a thin margin uh, and the likelihood, of course, this is the, you know, the, 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 the baseline of our discussion, um, that in November, the probability is that the Republicans who are very well organized to win elections by hook or crook, emphasis on crook, um, you know, will control both houses. And then we'll see no guardrails at all. I mean, God knows what kind of strange bills they will pass at uh, Trump's uh, suggestion. So as I understand it, Stephanie, the, you know, the point of the show today is to ask um, whether there are real indications um, that this is changing. And there are some indications that it may be changing. But I think we, we delude ourselves to think that those changes will carry the day. Well, you know, in, in addition to the lack of any qualifications whatsoever, if I hear you correctly. There, there's also absolutely no policy plan. There, there's no platform. Uh, so, so in addition to no, no know-how, no experience being brought to it, uh, we, have, we have no plan for it. Well, there, there, is, there is policy. I think, I think the Democratic um, rhetoric um, overstates that. This policy, the policy is... Uh, anti-immigration, isolationist, populism. The policy is um, um, racism, bigotry. The policy is, um, you know, don't take care of the disadvantaged in any way. The policy is let the 1% thrive and let the rest of the country go to hell. 
uh, the policy is to, um, I guess for a lot of people, <laughs> the support the dictators overseas, including Putin. And uh, the, the policy is all, you know, negative, wrong, destructive policy. That's the policy. It's just not without policy. It's just awful, awful policy. Well, you know, I this toxic politics coming out of that circumstance and um, being built by that implied platform, I suppose, and policy. Um, and, and, and with examples such as the RNC censure of the GOP members who are serving on the January 6th committee, has, has this toxicity escalated to unexpectedly higher levels? Karen, I mean, like, has it grown up? Uh, yeah, I would say so, yes. When they're censoring their own members, that's pretty toxic. And, you know, it's all based on whether they fall in line with Trump and his uh, coup or not. You know, if he if they don't support the coup, then, you know, they're out. Uh, uh, if they support the coup, then they're in. Although there does seem to be, to be honest, uh, some breakage with a line recently. There are a few Republicans. Mitch McConnell uh, is the most prominent one who's starting to uh, suggest he doesn't want Trump back. So the question is, I guess, who would who would they run if not Trump? Would there be somebody that could uh, follow the same in the same lines as him? Uh, the other thing with Trump is, of course, his uh, legislative issues, whether he will be in jail or what will be the status? Will it be a, a criminal, you know, violating a, a, a felon of some sort? So we won't know until then what how the cards play out. You know, can I jump in on that? Well, sure. we, we had a show uh, a couple of months ago where we looked at the likelihood that Trump would be caught by all this, by, by all these, you know, lawsuits and potential prosecutions and all. And I made a list of 50 tactics that he might employ. I think the last one is that he would move to Russia and, and take all the classified information with him. Um, that was my last choice. But, you know, there were like 50 things that he could do. We haven't even started that list yet. There's so many things, you know, uh, intimidation of witnesses, intimidation of jurors and intimidation of judges, um, you know, claiming it's all a witch hunt, having his people get out in the street and protest. Uh, there's so many things that he can do to derail all of that. Mm -hmm. So although, um, you know, the liberal press uh, tells us that there's progress made in, in those investigations in New York um, and I guess in Georgia. Um, and the liberal press tells us that, you know, there may be prosecutions of one kind or another coming down the pike uh, because of the insurrection. Uh, as you said, Karen, his insurrection, it, it belongs to him. It's his baby all the way. Um, I, you know, the query whether it's going to catch up with him. We don't have that much time. But in the meantime, you know, on the other side of that coin, the Republicans, are, we can never forget this any day of the week. The Republicans have been busy, busy, busy dismantling our voting system. Mm -hmm. And they have done a remarkable job. You got to hand it to them. You know, where the Democrats, um, you know, complain and and uh, and blame and um, you know talk high high policy and high high moral values. Fact is, the, the Republicans have already done a really good job in screwing up the voting system, and really that's that's the issue of the day from now till after November um, 2022, whether the voting system has enough left to work. Well, and in regard to Karen's comment about. Uh, McConnell um, being maybe a tiny little green spot in this, in this dearth of any positive signs at all. But um, he was uh, uh, criti critical of the, the uh, RNC's uh, chastising the, um, the, the members on the January 6th committee. And um, is it true that as Trump then said to um, the world, in his way now that the Senate leader does not speak for the GOP 
and uh, neither does he speak for the vast uh, majority of the voters for the Republican cause. So um, let's see, let's go back. Uh, Karen, can you talk to that? Did he, is that true that he said that? And what's the value of that comment? From well, I think it's very valuable because he uh, took a stand not only against Trump, but against the a Republican uh, National Committee who, you know, said that it was a normal, uh, I forget how they phrased it, it was a normal political activity to stage a coup or whatever. <laughs> uh, and they got a lot of uh, pushback from those remarks, including um, not just uh, Mitch McConnell, but a lot of other, uh, like um, uh, Mitt Romney, I think, pushed back. And there was other Republicans who pushed back against those remarks. So, uh, but one of the things I did happen to look at recently was um, just speaking of voting restrictions, as Jay brought up a minute ago, there have been a lot of voting restrictions put in place, but conversely, even though we don't hear about it, uh, the there's also uh, voting expansion occurring in a lot of states through the democratic states. So um, both are happening at the same time. We hear a lot about the restrictions. And I think the scary part of the restrictions is the intimidation of the electors who are you know, trying to keep it impartial. Like they've had a huge mass resignation of people who were you know, working in the voting arena, like the electors and the, they're afraid because they're getting all these threats and intimidation. I think that's really um, horrible that, you know, they can't even uh, have a fair election without being intimidated or a threat, their families being threatened. Mm -hmm. um, but there have been some laws passed and that is uh, according to what I found, 25 states have expanded voter access, particularly through voting, uh, making it easier to register, um, okay. mm -hmm. uh, automatic voter registration in some states, whereas uh, it's true, the, um, there have been some states who uh, went the other way, you know, the, usually the southern states, uh, which they've um, removed the mailboxes so they can't um, put their ballot in the mm -hmm. mailbox and they've uh, done a- That's the uh, drop box, you're referring to the drop box, right? Right, the drop box, right. And they purged a lot of people from the rolls. They gave, uh, they put in place as part of their new legislation deadlines on when you could vote or when you register to vote. So a lot of people didn't know about the deadline. So like they kicked in Georgia, like half the voters off because they missed the deadline. Mm -hmm. So they're doing stuff like that. But it's interesting, they have so far failed their big goal. According to the Brennan Center, they introduced 440 restrictive voting laws but the ones that failed were the ones that uh, attempted to exert partisan control over the election results, where the officials like Brad Raffensperger, um, you know, tr they wanted them to, him to call the election for Trump and he refused. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the pressure point is right now, I think. Well, they, they're, they're trying to elect um, uh, Republican acolytes um, to those offices, to Raffenberger's office, all over in every state, and they mm -hmm. and they put them on the ballots. And these guys are absolutely unqualified, and they're absolutely not impartial. They're mm -hmm. partial. They're yep. Republicans, and their and their sworn duty is to screw up the election. Um, okay. yeah. and, and, you know, now, I just want to mention I, I saw yeah. something on one of the um, the channels that I do watch. Uh, it, it was uh, a, a nonprofit, a, an ORG by the name of uh, Run for Something, Run for Something. Org, run mm -hmm. by a woman named Litman. That's all I remember. But this was a very worthy organization because they were running candidates against these GOP acolytes, um, and and they were trying to beat that initiative, um, you know, in in every state where it has appeared. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, we, we talked about last time, we, Stephanie, we talked about deciding where you would put your money oh, yeah. to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is an organization where you could put your money to make a difference. Uh, because it, it's a pressure point, as you said, it's a pressure point. Mm -hmm. And if we can't have a, a clean vote, you know, I mean, if there's confusion, 
people won't vote at all. If there's fatigue, call it political fatigue, they won't vote. They've given up a lot of people. Um, in 2020, um, the people were voting because they were somehow activated. And that carried the day, not, 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 not a sweeping result, but it carried the day. Uh, query what's going to happen in 2022. It may not be the same re result. Uh, it may be that people are really tired of all this toxicity. Um, they're tired of the, the, the daily fight. They're tired of the lies, and, and they've kind of given up. <laughs> and then they find uh, things like uh, the Republican effort to um, control the secretaries, uh, Secretary of State's um, and, you know, with people who are sworn to destroy the voting system. Mm -hmm. There's all these efforts that we find that Trump has made and could again try, mm -hmm. although he doesn't have the power of the White House, he could again, through his acolytes, try to find ways to do the same kind of terrible things. And so I think it's, and, and of course, then there's confusion. There's confusion as to which of those bills that Karen was talking about, which passed and which didn't pass, mm -hmm. and which prevailed in what state, and what are the rules? Are there drop-in boxes or not? Um, can you actually have your vote counted? There's, I swear there's going to be huge confusion. Even if you stop all these efforts right now today, uh, here in February, um, I think the confusion will last right through Election Day. And so that's a factor to consider as to what is going to happen here. And there is election day going on. OK, so today in Texas, it's early voting. It started today and it started with at least 40 percent of the, ma the mail in ballot applications, which are due tomorrow, being re rejected and disqualified and sent back. So my question is, Jay, doesn't this apply to Republicans as well as Democrats? Is this not as inconvenient one way as the other? Um, uh, who's happy about well, this? From a, a logical point right. of view, you would think it does. But, you know, they are attacking people on the wrong, their view of the wrong side of the racial equation. They're yeah. trying to de de disenfranchise uh, African-Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, anyone that's um, not a Republican. Well, uh, they, they have made a calculation, I'm sure. This is not, you know, a, a, a wild effort. This is a calculated effort that although this may affect some Republicans too, by and large, it's going to affect more Democrats. That's amazing. And, and, everybody... and more minorities, I should say. But everybody gets old, no matter who you are, and gets those same <laughs> difficulties to deal with. And this, these are not the days of a literacy, literacy test. I mean, and I, I was thinking that might be another reason, but this, that, that, that's not the same kind of club that they had many, many, or even a century ago. But it's been going on for a long time. So <clears throat> good. Well, OK, so, so you were asking about or talking about what this is looking like and going to be in the effect. So what, what do you think this voting outcome in Texas will mean to the politics? And will it increase the toxicity or lessen it or what, 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 what are you seeing coming out of this? Since Texas is evidently up first here, what are we going to find out? Are you asking me or Karen? Um, oh, oh, Karen, yeah, let's go over to you. Okay, well, uh, Texas was one of the ones that passed the most restrictive voting laws, so it's not surprising. Uh, I don't know per se exactly what they passed, but uh, they were there are four states that passed the most restrictive. That was Georgia, Iowa, Texas, and Florida. So I think uh, they're going to continue to try to politicize the voting process, just like they did with COVID. I mean, it seems to be that's a major strategy is to politicize everything that doesn't seem like it was political before. It used to be just a process that we followed and, you know, that we went to the doctor and got a vaccine. <laughs> but now uh, it's politicized and um, used as a kind of um, issue to uh, fight the other side with. So I think it's um, not a good sign. But I do think that if we look at these candidates, as you mentioned, Stephanie, that are that have been placed on the ballot against the, the state, um, the Secretary of State's who have vowed to um, mm -hmm. stay with Trump, then uh, that's a hu huge defeat for democracy. There's no way around it. 
But you know, the other thing that's interesting with the uh, Trump thing is if if he was if he was if the election was fraudulent, then all the Congress people were fraudulently elected, not just him. So the whole Congress would. So no one's even mentioned that, like uh, uh, the Republicans that got elected also be considered, you know, if it's fraudulent, it's fraudulent, not just. And that's not what he would say, though. He would say <laughs> is that the fraud is being done by the Democrats and, and the Republican Republican Congress people. Um, that they were properly. That's what he would say, because, you know, the man lies. He's a pathological liar. And when you identify a pathological liar, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I, I have met pathological liars, you know, and, and the old question after you watch them for a while is, how can you tell when they're lying? And the answer is when their lips are moving. Um, <laughs> okay, Jimmy. <laughs> I think there's one of the factors, definitely, that we have to consider. And uh, let's call it the the Canada phenomenon. Let's call it the the bridge the bridge to Canada phenomenon. You know that was largely organized by the GOP here in this country. And you mentioned Florida. Florida was among the states. Um, there was recently um, a, a, a tabulation of the money uh, that flowed into Canada for that protest, and it was. Uh, you know, certain certain states were prominent in the money that came from those states to support to create that protest. So I would say the protest was uh, created in the United States by the GOP, um, and um, the money came from states like Florida mm -hmm. and maybe Texas too uh, to support and and foment that unrest. And I mention all this because I, I think the GOP it, it goes beyond what we were saying early on about the toxicity, these guys are dedicated to bringing the country down. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it's just completely madness. It's madness. It's, it's out of Germany in the 30s. It's out of this world. <clears throat> but people go along with it because they don't see it. Well, <clears throat> and it's a cult. And so what we have here is a, a six or eight months, and although some elections are happening right now, we have a period of time in which it is entirely possible that the truck phenomenon or something like that, some kind of, what do you call it, economic insurrection, or maybe another real insurrection in the Capitol, or something like that, if we sat here for a while, we could think of some things that they could do, will take place before November. And that will absolutely affect the calculus. Well, now, I wanted to ask you and, and Karen about the what you're mentioning here with people just unqualified, not disqualified, but unqualified for the positions, and there seems to be no no a bar at all. Um, is this is this due to what um, I've seen um, described as GOP embracing the the pickup truck and uh, gun rack voters group? And so that these are the people that are stepping in and trying to run for office, even if they par participated in the January 6th assault. But um, is this something that's going on and why they're not noticing that only Trump lost the election? All the rest of the Republicans won their 2020 election. So, I mean, there's one huge fact out there, and it's an irony that the one guy that lost has just been having a fit ever since and is about ready to destroy our country. So, um, Jay, can you respond to that uh, as to um, the pickup truck and gun racks group? I love documentary movies. There's one documentary movie, I want to say it's on Prime, called The Gilded Age. And it's an examination of the years after the Civil War and until 1900 in this country. And of course, that's when we had our Industrial Revolution. That's when um, Carnegie, you know, uh, and Vanderbilt, Carnegie for steel, Vanderbilt for railroads, and ultimately uh, John D. Rockefeller for oil. Um, and they controlled the country and, and Wall Street. Um, they controlled the capital of the country. It was quite remarkable without income taxes or estate taxes, how wealthy they became as against the ordinary person. Mm -hmm. And in that period, and the, the movie goes into this, it's a, and I studied the subject in college, and I didn't know a lot of the things the movie taught me. 
um, is that we, we wound up with a, a divisiveness by the year 1896, uh, where uh, William Jennings Bryant wrote, wrote uh, he, he, uh, he ran for the populists, uh, the People's Party, which had been developing over the past decade or so. Um, and uh, um, William McKinley uh, ran for the capital concentration in Wall Street. And it was a kind of um, a turning point. It was a mandate. What, what did this country really want? Did it want to be controlled by the people and the populists in, in the center, in the hinterland of the country? Those guys who ride around with the shotguns in the back of their pickup trucks, those guys. Uh, and don't and don't care much about what happens on Wall Street, or um, would it be controlled by Wall Street? Mm -hmm. um, and McKinley won, and um, and and that's kind of where the movie goes. It's very interesting. I I was aware of that in some vague way when I when I studied it in college, but now I'm more aware of it, and and I think that has stuck with us, and that ha that has pervaded the the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And probably still now today, there are a lot of people who would like us to be a, a liberal country, a democratic country, a country that cares, the Biden type people. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the capital that, that counts. Mm -hmm. And in the process, you have this tremendous division that started in the 19th century, yeah. um, you know, between the, the cities, the coasts, the business uh, sector uh, and the agricultural sector in the hinterland. Well, you know, um, I think that uh, we could go back and talk a little bit about McConnell after that interesting point, Jay. But um, Karen, was Trump's comment threatening to McConnell, the one we mentioned earlier about how he doesn't speak for anybody, no matter that he's the said the Senate leader? Um, and and um, is 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 McConnell McConnell getting threatened by Trump? And also those who are you all have all talked, discussed those running in primaries as Trumpers who promised to knock McConnell out if they win. I think at least two of them have made a promise about that or 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 that they they may danger um, the GOP majority. What do you what do you think about McConnell? I think uh, McConnell and Trump are definitely at odds right now. And uh, in fact, didn't he, he has a new name for him, Turtleneck or something. I can't remember what he calls him. He has, you know how he always comes up with these derogatory names. <laughs> he has a name for McConnell now. <laughs> and uh, so he gets on the media and, and you know, uses that. And so, um, and then I think McConnell was one of the ones, if you remember after the um, coup, the attempted coup that he stood up and said that that was wrong, it, you know, at the vote afterward and he kind of caved after that but i think he's going back to that um point of view i don't think he wants to see trump in again and so he's going to try to use his power to make you know if he such that he has uh to make sure that he doesn't come back mm -hmm. well, there's an interesting interesting element there is that if, if you accept um you know the the common view uh, that McConnell is only into his own power. That's what that's what he lives for. You know, I, mean, I would like to say, like good literature, that people change. You know, in good literature, people change, and you see the dynamic of human development, and it's, you know, it's always the study in good literature. Well, I don't think McConnell changes. I think he's into power. He was into power then, and he's into power now. Um, and uh, I think the reason that he dishes on. Uh, on Trump is that um, he thinks that ultimately Trump is going to attack him. I mean, at home in an election and, and unseat him. So it doesn't, A, it doesn't matter if he attacks Trump and B, he's got to gird his loins. He's got to solidify his position. And he thinks it's the smartest thing to do in terms of the next election for him. Yeah. Very good. Right. Well, we um, are out of time. And I uh, thank you, panelists, Jay Fidel and Karen Buzzard, uh, for this wonderful show discussion. We've got much more to say maybe next time. I am Stephanie Stoll Dalton, your host for Politics for the People. We'll see you next week. Thank you and aloha.